last time you prayed? I mean, before the service today, right? Like, because we just sang songs. Maybe you don't know this. If you're new to church, that's what those songs are. Those songs are prayers. And so some of you are like, I don't know. Well, in this service, you probably just prayed 10 minutes if you sang those two songs. Or you even just thought about the words we were saying. Because when we sing those songs, what we're doing is they're prayers. They're prayers about who we believe God is. They're prayers about what we believe and want God to do in our lives. But other than this last few minutes, when was the last time you prayed? And now I want you to think about how did it feel after you prayed? Like, like was it awkward or was it comfortable? Did you pray with confidence, knowing that God is there and listening, even if you don't feel it? Or was it maybe prayed with some little insecurity, like, man, I wonder if this whole thing works. You see, I think most people want to pray. We want to regularly connect with God, but maybe nobody's ever taught us how to do it, or we've tried it and it just hasn't felt natural. And so maybe it's one of those areas that we know we should do more, but we're just not doing it or maybe not feeling like we're doing it right. That's why we're starting this new series today. It's our summer series uh, called Lifeline, where we're going to talk about and learn how do we pray by walking through the Lord's Prayer. And what we're going to do today, today is an intro week and an overview. And then each of the next weeks, we're going to take one petition at a time and go through the Lord's Prayer this summer. And so each week, we're going to teach on a different aspect of that and talk about what does it show us about God and what does it teach us about prayer. But again, this week is an intro and an over overview. But this is a special Sunday for a couple reasons, not just because it was our salute to grads but also because I have one of my very best friends in the world, Brian Cedarwall, that's gonna share the message with me today. We're gonna do a little tag team. I'm gonna do a little at the beginning, then turn it over to him, then I'll come back and close it out. Uh, Brian uh, is the founder and director of the Denver Dream Center, which is an urban inner city ministry that reaches more than 50,000 people through their services and resources every single year, um, addressing needs in the city like poverty, hunger, homelessness, um, uh, at-risk youth, uh, those that are recovering from addiction, those that are getting out of incarceration. It just leads an incredible ministry. He'll talk to you a little bit about it and you'll get to hear about it. Uh, but we have been friends, here's what you need to know about him, since 1982. I was eight years old, he was seven years old. I was in second grade, he was in first grade. I've always been the older, wiser friend, all right? I just wanna make sure you understand that. Uh, we lived in the same neighborhood from a, in a small town in Illinois. Uh, we went to the same grade school. We grew up in the same church. We went to college in the same town. We were in each other's weddings. Uh, and then somehow, miraculously, uh, through all the trouble we got into, somehow we both became pastors, um, which I think our parents are like, that's amazing. Um, and our teachers probably, because they didn't see that coming. Uh, but since we've been friends for so long, I thought I'd rustle up a few classic photos. I mean, I could go all the way back to second grade, but I thought I'd just take you back to middle school, okay? Here's a picture of us in middle school. That's yours truly in the red t-shirt over there to the right. Um, and uh, you can see Brian's rocking the 1980s see-through mesh shirt on the left, all right? Apparently it wasn't guns out, but it was nips out in that picture. So. Um, you do you, man. All right. Um, and then uh, here's a picture of us in high school. Just a two couple of basketball studs who want some of that on the court. <laughs> Nobody. That's what I'm talking about, right? Like, so uh, we have been great friends for most of our life and really is a treasure to have friendships that last that long that you can share life with. Um, so I'm super glad that you're going to get to hear from him in just a moment. Now, as we kick this off, the reality is probably some of us have reasons we don't pray or don't feel comfortable praying. And what we want to do today is I want to talk to you about reasons we sometimes don't or struggle with prayer. Then we're going to talk about reasons we should pray. And we're going to end by just giving you an overview of how we pray, understanding the Lord's prayer as we kick off this summer prayer series. So, Reasons we don't pray or reasons we struggle with prayer. If you're taking notes today, write this first one down. Some of us would simply say this, you know what? 
I just really don't know how to pray. Maybe nobody ever taught you how to pray. You've never been around anybody that prays confidently or comfortably. And so maybe for you, prayer never got passed at a holiday. Well, maybe we should pray before we eat this meal. It's Christmas, right? Or maybe we should pray before. And so prayer just never was something that you were taught and you just don't, you know, really understand it. I think others of us would simply say this. We would say, oh man, I just, I just don't have time to pray. I just, don't, I just don't have time. I mean, from the moment I wake up, it's go, go, it's busy, it's responsibilities, it's get people here, it's get people there, it's go to work. Uh, and the truth is, probably most of us, we have the time, we just don't use it well. We're probably, you know, on our devices from the time we wake up to any waking moment, there's just not downtime. And so sometimes it's, hey, we're busy, we don't have time, but a lot of, we just don't make time. The third one, some of you would be honest and say this, you know what, I've tried it, but if I'm honest, I just don't enjoy praying. Because maybe when you tried it, you're fighting distractions, uh, it leaves you feeling frustrated rather than peaceful, uh, it, it just, you know, it, it, it's just awkward. There wasn't energy and transformation in it for you. And so you would go, man, I, I tried it, but it just didn't feel like it works, you know? And then another group of us, I think some of us might honestly say this, the reason I don't pray is I don't think prayer works. Maybe part of your story is that you go, you know what, I really prayed for something. I needed God to come through Somebody I loved, or maybe in your own life, like, man, they needed a healing, they were sick. Maybe there was a relationship that was broken. Maybe there was a job opportunity that you were qualified for, that you were convinced was the right thing for you, and the job offer never came. The relationship was never restored, or the person was never healed. And so maybe you're going, man, I, I prayed, I asked God to intervene, I asked God for help, but I didn't see it happen. And so why should I pray? That's one of the questions we're actually gonna answer during the series. What do we do with our faith when our prayers aren't answered? We're gonna talk about that. I think it's like week number four or five of the series. And the truth is each one of these reasons not to pray, I have dealt with and had to work through in my own faith story. And here's what I found. Even though there are reasons that prayer is hard or that we struggle with prayer, the reasons to pray or the benefits of prayer are much greater than the struggles of prayer. And so what are the reasons to pray? Well, the first one is this, if you're taking notes. The first reason to pray is that prayer is personal. Prayer is personal. The first and primary goal of prayer is that it changes me. It heals me it brings me closer to God. The point of prayer is to gain a spiritual perspective over my natural reality. In prayer, we are not trying to bring God down to us as if God's not aware of what's going on in our life. Through prayer, we are trying to bring ourselves up to God. We're trying to have his perspective, to see it from his point of view. You see, Jesus knew prayer was personal and that he needed the inner strength that comes from prayer. Think about who Jesus was. He was fully God and man at the same time. Yet look at what Luke chapter five tells us about Jesus. It says, Jesus often withdrew to lonely places and, say it out loud, prayed. Think about that. Why does God in the flesh need to pray? Because Jesus knew that he, even in this world, needed to gain the spiritual perspective and have the spiritual strength that comes through prayer. And so he often took time to get away and be alone with God. He knew he needed to recharge and reconnect with God so that he could do everything that God was calling him to do. And if Jesus needed to regularly pray to be able to walk the path that God had for him, How much more do you and I need to be able to pray regularly and often to be able to walk the path that God has for us? And so we have to understand that prayer is personal. It's about connecting with God, growing in a relationship with him. And the second thing, as my friend Brian comes up, here's the second reason we pray, because prayer is powerful. Well, good morning. 
Wish I had a little bit longer, a little more time to share stories from my perspective. Um, he might be older, but not wiser. Um, man, to, to reflect back on over 40 years of being best friends is amazing, and it's an honor to be here. Prayer is not only personal, it is powerful. It, it'll not only change me, but it'll change circumstances and things around me. You know, one of the things that, and I still call him Jimmy, so that tells you how old our friendship is, the, probably the last person on planet Earth that still refers to him as Jimmy. Um, but growing up, we had parents that knew how to pray. And thankfully, we grew up in church and around church. And matter of fact, it was probably their prayers that kept us out of a lot of deeper trouble situations. But growing up in a small town in Illinois, we had a lot of extra free time. We didn't have technology, right? There were no cell phones, internet, games. Our parents were old school. They would kick us out of the house and lock the door and say, go play, right? We actually had to use our imagination. Anybody remember how that worked back in the day? Um, now it's this. But so we would create games. And one of the games that we used to play, feel free to take this. You can play it um, during service, after service. We simply called it last hit. Not complicated, but before we would end our day and we saw each other at school, school bus, at church, whatever, and it would be timing like, Jimmy, see ya. And I would try to hit him and make sure I ran. And the glory of the game was I got the last hit of the day. I know it's, that's the whole game. Um, we, we had a lot of free time on our hands. But it was amazing how often we play that game. Something would happen in, in middle school. We were actually coming back from, I think we went bowling or something, and we were coming back, and Jimmy's parents were dropping me off, and we were riding. His parents had this classic early 1980s um, old police car. The white looked like a tank, weighed a million pounds. Um, and so we were driving back to my house, and we were both configuring our mind. We knew what was about to happen, right? They're going to pull up to my house. I have to figure out how to get out of the back seat of the car, get the last hit without Jimmy hitting me back. So we know we're both strategizing, right? It gets a little bit quiet the last couple of minutes because it's about to go down. We get to my house, and as I'm opening the door, thanking his parents for, the, for driving us, and I'm like, all right, see ya. I hit him, and I'm trying to get out of the car. Of course, he slides over, and he's already prepared. He hits me back, and now we're in this little dance dog and pony show of me trying to hit him, get out. He hits me. I'm jumping back in, but while we're doing this in the back seat, his dad's trying to pull away. So he's going forward, stop, forward, stop, I'm in, I'm out. Everything was on timing and on point until a couple minutes into it, I'm reaching in and, and he starts to drive over my foot. So here I am with my foot and as the car, remind you this, this 1980 police car that weighed a million pounds, he started to pull over my foot and of course halfway on it, now I'm screaming, you know, you're on my foot, you're on my foot. So he's panicking, not knowing what to do, so he puts the car in reverse. He's like, I'll just back off of your foot. Well, he was already off my foot, so now he's backing over my foot. So now I'm screaming, no, go forward, go forward, you're on my foot. He doesn't know what to do. God's honest witness is he puts the car in park to get out and see what's happened with my foot. And I don't know why, but I, I still vividly remember Jimmy in the back seat. Like, he's panicking for me, but can't do anything. So he's doing this Chris Farley thing where he jumps out of the car and he's just like running in circles. I don't even know why, but I still can visually see that. Like, it helped me in my moment. And so some of you remember those old school cars, like the front seat was like built like a couch. Where, yeah. And so his mom literally has to slide over, put it, and drive to get off my foot. But here's what's amazing in that moment, having parents that knew how significant prayer was. They didn't just grab me, take me in to get x-rays and into the hospital, but they grabbed me, they pulled me up. Here I am in seventh grade and they put me in my house. And the first thing they did was they just began to pray. And my parents, his parents, they just laid hands on my foot. They truly believed that prayer is powerful. And they prayed that prayer of faith over my foot and in the situation. Then we go in to get an x-ray and the x-ray came back, not a bone broken, not even a bruise on my foot. The next day I was able to even go play in a basketball game because prayer is powerful. I still blame Jimmy somehow. Um, so if I see you lean over to somebody and you give them a little hit while you're sitting, like you can practice now, but it's way better when you get in the parking lot. Um, prayer is powerful. It changes things. You know, there's amazing stories that you can read throughout scripture. You can read throughout history where prayer literally moved mountains and changed situations. In John chapter, first John chapter five, it says this, we live in the bold confidence that God hears our voices. 
when we ask for things that fit his plan. And if we have no doubt that he hears our voices, we can be assured that he moves in response to our call. So many amazing words in that verse, bold, that we can pray with boldness, that we have confidence that he hears us and then he begins to move on our behalf. Now the pushback would be how many of us have prayed powerful prayers, but we haven't seen results. Right? And, and, and it creates questions where we're like, I'm, I'm praying and in faith, and that's great that your foot was healed in that moment, but, but I'm praying and I don't see. But we also know that it aligns with God's will and in his timing and his plan. My mom is uh, an amazing woman of God. Again, that, that prayer of faith kind of a person. Um, a few years ago, I got the call that is devastating for, for anybody. My mom had a stroke. And so I'm trying to get out of Denver and my parents now live in Missouri. And as I'm getting there, we get to the hospital and I go in, my brother, my dad, and my sister are there. And here's my mom in, in a hospital bed. And she didn't have the ability to speak. And so we just begin to pray for my mom, right? This same prayer, prayer of faith. God, we know you can heal, you can restore. Um, I had to fly back to Denver a few days later. A week or so later, she gets out of the hospital, starts to rehab and physically she's good, but she lost her ability to speak. And so we're praying for these miracles God, heal her voice. We know you can give her her words back. And she's this prayer warrior. Um, and she never regained her ability to speak. But what we do know is the healing might not take place here and now, but for eternity, right, she will be healed. And so our timing has to fit within God's perfect plan. And we pray these prayers that are powerful because we know that God moves. Prayer is powerful. Not only that, but prayer is, per is pleasing. It's interesting because you ever wonder sometimes, does God ever get tired of my prayers. You ever feel like you just go so much that God can never just be annoyed or bothered with the amount of prayers that we bring? There's an amazing picture in the book of Revelation, chapter eight, that says, another angel with a gold incense burner came and stood at the altar. A great amount of incense was given to him to mix with the prayers of God's people as an offering on the gold altar before the throne. The smoke of the incense mixed with the prayers of God's holy people ascended up to God from the altar where the angel had poured them out. See, these prayers literally interrupt heaven. And it's amazing to think that not only are our prayers heard, but that God pauses and that God listens. It's become a little bit more real for me. I've got three teenage boys, so you can pray for my wife um, because I'm in the fourth boy that she's raising still. And so my house is literally, if it can be tackled, hit, broken, punched, I mean, that's how we wake up every morning. My boys are all in aggressive, and so our, our life is interesting. But as my boys were little, I used to record um, their voices. And I would just ask them simple questions like, what's your favorite sports? And what do you like to do? And how old are you? And what's your favorite subject? And they're, right, they're little voices. And now that my oldest is 19 and in college, and I have a 16 and 13, um, sometimes I'll go back and I'll listen to those recorded voices. And as a father, right, it just melts your heart because you love to hear the voice of your children. How much more does our Heavenly Father love to hear? And even if we bring back the same thing over and over and over again, that prayer is pleasing and that God listens. Not only is it powerful, prayer is pleasing. And we have this incredible picture of what prayer is, but really the practical question is, well, how, how do I pray? And I'm excited for Eastlake as a church to go through this summer series because there's so much to unpack from the Lord's Prayer that we'll get into in just a minute. And it gives us this outline of really, how do I pray? How do we answer that question? How many, how many grew up in church or been around church for a little bit? And if you're like me, growing up in church, there's always um, a, a prayer rally or a prayer service, right? Or times you come together and like, let's get a circle and hold hands and pray. You ever get in one of those? And if you're like me, and maybe it's just me, um, I was just old enough that I don't think they had Ritalin and stuff for ADD as a kid. And so I survived all that without being medicated. And so I would get in a prayer circle and right away, right, I'm trying to pray. But I'm like, oh man, your hand is sweaty, right? And I'm thinking about this person's hand over here. And then I'm like holding this hand, like, man, your hand is so small. And right, I'm just so distracted. And then I'm like, all right, focus, gotta pray, gotta pray. And I'm like looking at people's shoes, like, huh, look at, right? I'm like, no, gotta pray, right? And then like, I'm, I'm, God, I got this. And I start to pray, but I'm thinking about what I want for lunch. And before I know it, like, am I, am I get there? Come on, right? Like, I can't keep this thing focused. And so how do I construct prayer? And this model of prayer is so powerful in Matthew chapter six. We often call it the Lord's Prayer 
or the Our Father. And if you have time before you get into the series, go back and read the first few verses because Jesus sort of gives them this insight first. Like there's people that pray really loud and it's, and it's showy. He's like, don't, don't pray for show. And for people to recognize, oh, you must be spiritual because I see how much you pray. Or he says, it's not words. Sometimes we get caught in that moment. We don't know what to say. It's like there's people that are very wordy and that's not the basis. But here is the premise in Matthew chapter six, verse nine. He says, in this manner, therefore pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. And when Jesus gives us this prayer, because the disciples come to him, you can read the parallel in Luke chapter 11. They literally ask, how, how do we pray? Pastor James references that Jesus, with his disciples, would often find times where he would get away and he would what? He would pray. So he modeled for them this behavior, this pattern of prayer. And so they come to him and like, man, you pray so well. Like, how do we pray? And he gives them this, not so that they had a prayer necessarily to recite, but a prayer that gave them a model of how to pray. So again, if you're a note taker, write this down. Number one, that we get to pray with confidence and worship. We had to pray with confidence and worship. So Jesus starts this way. He says, our Father, which art in heaven. He could have started a million different ways. He could have said, almighty, all powerful, glorious, omniscient God, right? He could have started with a million different attributes of who God is, but he starts with this one, our Father. Meaning that God is approachable. Some of us had great dads and fathers. And we get what that means with the idea of being able to approach and know that there's someone there. Some of us grew up in broken homes or maybe without a father, but the Bible paints for us a picture of a perfect father. And so when we pray, he simply starts with this idea of our father, that he's approachable. And not only that he's approachable or with confidence, but in Matthew 6 verse 9, he says, our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. So he walks us through this pattern of one recognizing that he's a father, that he's approachable, there's confidence. But it says also there's this idea of worship. Living and recognizing who truly God is. The word hallowed means holy or holy literally conveys the idea of being set apart. There's something significant about the name of our God. That when we pray, he's not just a God. He's not just something out there, not a cosmic force or, or entity, but he is the creator of the universe, that he is the God. And when you and I begin to go to prayer, one, we recognize that he's our heavenly father, that I can approach him with confidence. And then I begin to worship. One of the greatest ways you can begin your prayer time is put on a worship song. All right, take something that the, the band sang today and just learn to worship or take a verse or focus on who he is because praise creates a perspective for us. Number two, not only do we pray with confidence and worship, we pray with peace and we seek God's priorities. When we find peace in prayer, we trust in God's kingdom over our own. Our soul can find inner peace in a world filled with chaos. Anybody feel like you need that? When you look at the news, you look at the economy, you go downtown for just a couple of minutes, right? You, you see what's going on in the world around us and something that's filled with so much chaos, we have a place to find peace. Matthew 6, verse 10 says, your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Here's why this is so key. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. If you think about what heaven is, it's a place of perfection. Right, no more sickness, no more disease, no more sin. That's ultimately where we can't wait to be. But Jesus says, here's how I want you to pray. Pray that this right here, this perfection, what heaven is, pray that this would invade earth. And when we live in a space that's filled with so much chaos and so much stress, how do we deal with that? We pray for his perfect peace. We pray for his kingdom to come and it repositions our priorities. We learn to live with his peace in the midst of chaos. And then it realigns our priorities. So when we pray, your kingdom come, then you personalize it. Your kingdom come in my family. Your kingdom come. Again, kingdom, perfect. No more sin, no more disease, no more sickness, no more hurt, no more pain, no more frustration, no more heartbreak. Your kingdom come in my family, in my finances. Your kingdom come in my children, in my business. Come into our city, our country, right? When we pray, your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven. Number three, he says... To pray with faith for what you need. 
We have a heavenly father that looks out for us. And so when we begin to recognize that he is our Abba Father, that he's our heavenly father, and we begin to, to worship, hallowed be your name, let your kingdom come on earth as it is in heaven, then that perspective allows us to pray personal, saying, give us this day our daily bread. Pastor James loves that because it gives you freedom to eat all the carbs you want. <laughs> but in that moment, we pray because we know that he is wanting to, to care for us. And our journey, if I had more time, and you can find me afterward or, or look at our website, um, I pastored up in L.A. County for about eight years. And in 2005, we felt God stirring and calling us to move to Denver, Colorado. And when I tell people now looking back, I could literally write a book on how to not plant a church or start a business. We told our church in July, we had a baby in August, we sold our house in September, and we left in October. So in four months, we quit our job, sold our house, we had a two-year-old and a brand new baby, and we're driving out to Colorado. I knew two people in the entire state. And I'm calling friends like Pastor James saying, hey, God gave us this, this vision. We know he's faithful, but we need churches and we need people to come along and support us. And everybody I would talk to, like, dude, we got you. We'll revisit our budget, our missions, and we'll bring you in you know, next year. I'm like, I have till next month. I left in October, and we had four weeks that we had insurance and income, and it was starting from scratch. We get out to Colorado, and I wish I could tell you as a pastor, man, we prayed and there were miracles and the budget came and a year into it, it blew up. I worked part-time jobs for 10 years, and we just had to grind like crazy. Shortly into our journey there, I was actually driving my wife's car, and um, uh, long story short, I ended up running into the back end of a big truck, and I told her a car. Um, and I get out of the car. Of course, the big truck is fine. Everybody's there, but my wife's car's totaled. I'm bleeding everywhere. I got glass in my hands and face, and I'm a mess, and the, the medic gets there, and they're like trying to get me in the ambulance, but all I can think of is I don't have health insurance right now, and I cannot afford your ambulance ride, and I definitely can't afford an ER visit. So I'm like, you know what? Do what you gotta do, but I, I'm not going with you. Like, sir, you're coming with us. I'm like, I'm not going anywhere. Just stop the bleeding, do what you gotta do. And so they bandage me up, and they literally leave me on the side of the road. I gotta figure out a ride home, and I get home. My wife's like, you're an idiot. I don't know, but I'm alive, and I'd have to pay for an ER bill. Um, but the next day, I'm thinking like, oh my gosh, I got like all this glass, and, and what do I do? And just prior to that, I had met a dentist. And so if you're a dentist, thank God for you because I didn't know any doctors yet. So I called my dentist friend. I'm like, hey, I got all this glass in me. Can you, um, Nova came me up and just pull the glass out. He's like, actually sounds sort of cool. And so I go in and my dentist, Nova canes me up and pulls the glass out. Now listen, not that you gotta go through that journey, but God is faithful to meet every need. And now I can report to you what we get to do in Denver isn't because it happened overnight, but God is faithful. And when we pray daily bread, God knows what we need and he is there to provide. And there's amazing stories. And as we continue in, I'm gonna pass it back to Pastor James to move into pray with humility and confession. All right, great job. If you're ever up in Denver, look up uh, the Denver Dream Center. They do amazing work in the urban areas and the city and uh, have so many ways for people to volunteer and uh, be a part of all the ministry they're giving. Uh, and it's super fun to have one of my best friends in the world get to hang out uh, with our church. So pray with humility and confession. This is where we talk to God about whatever has been trying to pull us away from him. We own our sin and we confess it. We don't hide it. We don't justify it. We don't explain it away. We own it and we say, God, would you forgive it and remove it? Which by the way, God already knows what it is. If you're ever going to prayer and you're like, oh, I don't know if I wanna, if I wanna bring this one up. He's already totally aware, all right? Like he already knows. He saw it when it first happened. If he's not like, you did what? So when you go to prayer after you've said, you know what, I have a good heavenly father who loves me, who gives me his perspective, who brings his presence and his kingdom into my life and into the world. He, he says, bring all your needs to me. Give me this day our daily bread. And then he says, here's what I want to do. And this is the next part of the prayer. Verse 12, we pray and forgive us our what? Say it out loud. Debts. Forgive us the things that we have done wrong. And then 
help us as we forgive our what? Debtors. What we're learning to pray here is we say, God, give me forgiveness and then help me to be a forgiver. Because don't you need God's help to be a forgiver? I don't know about you, but I hold grudges really well. You know, you hurt me, I'm like, ooh, I wanna hurt you. Or I pray somebody else does, right? Like that's, that's my natural reaction. Some of you are like, are you allowed to be a pastor? Um, <laughs> yes, because God's still working on me, right? It's why I have to go to prayer and say, man, Lord, remove that vengeful, selfish, angry part out of my heart. And Lord, the way you've forgiven me when I've wronged you, would you help me to forgive other people when they wrong me? It's something we have to work out in prayer. And then the last petition of the Our Father is this. We need to learn how to pray with openness for God's power. Openness for God's power. As we empty ourselves of sin and our priorities and our hurts, God promises to fill us up with his spirit to give his power in us so we can do what we can't do on our own, which is what? Flee temptation. You were never meant to have to live this life of faith in your own strength and power. Scripture tells us the moment we say yes to Jesus, that the Holy Spirit that was working outside on us before salvation now lives in us. The same spirit that raised Christ from the dead, Scripture said, is alive inside of you, every believer in Jesus. And what prayer does is it teaches us how to tap into God's spirit that's already in us and to walk in his spirit, as Scripture says, rather than to walk in or live in our flesh, our own strength and power. And so the last part of the prayer is this. It's in verse 12. And do not lead us into what? But deliver us from the evil one. The last part of the prayer reminds us that there is a real spiritual battle that we are all living in every single day. And the truth is for most of us, we don't think about that. We don't live aware that there's an enemy of our soul that is trying to set traps for us to pull us off of God's best and off of his path. And so we end prayer by saying, Lord, help me resist those traps. Help me to have eyes to see and ears to hear what your spirit is saying and doing. Not what the enemy wants me to do. Not what culture wants me to do. Not what the world wants me to do. Not what my flesh wants to do. But God, help me live and walk in your spirit. So here's our goal for this summer prayer series. That every single one of us will grow in this way of prayer. What I want for you this summer is I want you to develop this rich, meaningful connection with God that helps you experience his presence, which is available to you every single day, wherever you are. You see, what prayer does, it doesn't bring God down to us. It takes up, us up to where God is. It gives us his perspective. It brings us into his presence. And then we can see and encounter his power. And I want that for you this summer. I want you to get on the other side of this series and go, wow, I'm praying more regularly. It's more meaningful than it's ever been before. And so here is my summer prayer challenge. I'm issuing this in every service today. Will you pray the Lord's prayer every day, starting today. Each day, would you say the Lord's Prayer? Some of you grew up reciting the Lord's Prayer, so you're like, okay, we're doing that again. All right, let's go. But here's what I want you to do. Not just recite it, but I want you, because we're gonna teach through each part of the Lord's Prayer each week, and we're gonna learn next week. What does the, our Father in heaven, hallowed be thy name? What does that teach us about God, and what does it show us about prayer? And we're also gonna attach a way of Jesus that Jesus teaches that same principle each week. It's gonna be a great series. But when you pray each petition, I want you just to say the first line, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed, which by the way, our Father in heaven's name is not art, okay? Some of you were like, what's God's name? It's art, right? Our Father who art in heaven? Yeah, no, that's, that's a bad pastor joke, I know, but. Um, so you pray, okay, our, our Father in heaven, holy, hallowed, be your name. And then I want you to pause and just re-say that first line in your own words. 
God, thank you that you're approachable. Thank you that you love me. You are holy and awesome. Could be that simple. And then go to the next line. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Pause and then just say a sentence or two in your own words. Start doing that each day during the series and watch how God grows your faith and grows your prayer life. Will you join me in that challenge? All right, if you will, stand to your feet. If not, you're gonna be sitting in here all day, okay? So I mean, so you're like, I don't know if I'm gonna do the challenge, but you might wanna stand up, all right. Hey, here's how we're gonna close today. Uh, the, the team is gonna lead us in a last song. It is a great prayer. The prayer of this last song is God, turn it around. And I don't know what you're facing in your life today, where you need God to turn something around, but the good news is he is here, he loves you, and he wants to be at work in your life. Maybe for some of you, you need God to turn around a relationship where there's some strife, some angst, some hurt. Pray that God begins to turn that around. Maybe it's in your finances, maybe it's in your business. Maybe it's in your future, you feel like, man, I'm at this dead end job, it's not where I wanna be, it's not doing what I want. God, would you turn that around? Would you open a door of opportunity? I don't know where you need God today, but he is here. And what this prayer series is gonna allow us to do is to tap into his presence and to see things from his perspective and to experience his power. So let's sing this out with faith today, believing that God's gonna turn things around in our life wherever we need it most. Uh, but here's what I want us to do. I want us to pray the Lord's prayer all together out loud. And then we're gonna go into the song. So we're gonna put that up on the screen. Everybody inside, everybody outside, everybody at home, let's pray the Lord's prayer together out loud. Ready, begin. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.